believe that everything in life relates to gun training, and everything in gun training relates to life. Join us as we explore the Defender's lifestyle through the lens of self-improvement. Welcome to Defender's Live. Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Defenders Live. I am your host, Laura Thorson, and we have a treat for you tonight. We're going to be talking to Chris Bean of Tactical Advantage. But before we bring him on, I just want to thank you for watching tonight. Thank you all who are attending. And if you're watching this as a replay or you're new to the channel, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And as always, you guys know the drill. Please drop in the comments where you're watching from. We want to hear from you. And don't be shy. Feel free to engage in those comments throughout the live. As always, Adam Winch, the founder of Defenders USA, is helping me behind the scenes. And here is a quick message from Adam about our friends and sponsors. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, Adam Winch with Defenders USA. I want to tell you about some of our friends and sponsors. I'm a brand ambassador with H&K Firearms. I carry a VP9 from H&K in defense of life. I use it on the range. I use it in training. This is my go-to gun. I highly recommend the VP9 from H&K. Next, Iron American. You can see this bottle here or the one that's hanging off my range bag in front of the camera. That's what I use for liquid chalk on the range. There's also a discount code through Defenders USA that you can get some and I'd strongly encourage you to order some liquid chalk from Iron America. Next, my gun is carried in a Haven Defense Co. holster. You can find them at Haven Defense CO com Haven Defense Co. You can see their brown leather patch on the front of the bag. And then of course there's a Defenders USA patch. You can come to training and try to earn that patch too from Defenders USA. And don't forget, we're going to have a live Q&A session tonight at the end of the live. So be thinking about questions for Chris. And if you think of something while we're talking, go ahead, put them in the comments. We're going to star all of those. And uh, towards the end of the broadcast, we'll be asking him those questions. And um, oh, the other thing I wanted to remind you to is to stick uh, stick around till the end, because at the end, I'm going to be telling you who's coming on next week. And not just that, but I wanted to do kind of an ask the audience thing towards the end. So you'll understand why. Um, but stick around till the end for that. So let's see who is here tonight. Looks we've got Haven Defense Co. from Colorado. Hey, Brent, thanks for watching tonight. Tori's back. Hey, Tori, where are you at tonight? We're so glad that you're here. And we've got Lynn and Kathy from Arizona uh, are back. So that's wonderful. And Anne Marie from Fort Worth. Thank you for watching. Nancy, my good friend Nancy from Montana is here tonight. I'm so glad you're watching. And hey, Scars, good to see you back tonight as well. That was a great video you posted the other day. And we have Stephanie from South Dakota. Hey, Steph, thank you for watching. And Juan from Arizona. So thank you guys all for tuning in. Um, I am going to go ahead and bring Chris on here in just a minute. We're so glad that you're here tonight. We've got a really fun guest tonight. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. Uh, I've gotten to know Chris a little bit better over the last few weeks um, because he is part of the Active Self-Protection Instructor uh, Certification. Cohort 6 is what I'm in, and he's one of the instructors for that. So um, he is a, a brilliant mind. Chris is a one-of-a-kind person. I've never met anyone like him before, and uh, he has uh, one of those minds that has a really deep curiosity for finding out what makes people tick. But it's paired with this insanely deep desire and a huge, huge heart to help others get where they want to be. And so uh, it's a really cool combination. You'll understand why here in a minute. But Chris comes to us with an extensive background in human capital management and leadership development in the corporate environment. He's also had over 20 years of firearm-related professional coaching experience. And in addition to his role as co-director, that's what it was, co-director of the Active Self-Protection Instructor Certification Program, he's also a success, successful defensive space business owner affiliated with some of the best-known defensive 
extensive companies in the U.S., including his role as part of the coaching staff at The Complete Combatant. You may have heard of Brian Hill and The Complete Combatant. He's been on these lives before as well. Chris enjoys personal growth activities, pursuit of perfection in pistol craft, as well as spending time with his European Doberman Pinscher, Caesar. So bring this on. Hey, Chris, thanks for coming on tonight. Hi, that was very kind. Thank you. Oh, well, it's just how I feel. That's just what I say, how I feel. So um, we really appreciate you coming on. I know there are a lot of people really looking forward to this live tonight. And um, and I know it's a little bit late where you are in Georgia compared to where I'm at in Montana. So uh, I appreciate that, you, that you've taken the time I'm, and it's past your bedtime. So <laughs> appreciate you doing that for us. No, I appreciate the opportunity. So let's just start, I wouldn't say at the beginning, but let's uh, build a little bit more background and perspective for people because you have a very different, in my opinion, a very different training style and philosophy than I've seen from a lot of other uh, firearms instructors. And um, could you tell us a little bit more about your journey uh, as, as a coach and your, what your approach is in helping other people get to where they want to be? Sure. So... I think really where it started. So I've been in, in general industry, heavy industry, uh, the corporate world for uh, over 25 years or so. And that's really where I started realizing I enjoyed helping people figure things out. Um, so in that environment, you have to deal with a myriad of, of different, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, you know, experience levels, things like that. So very early on in my life, I, I really kind of wanted to understand how to put puzzles together with people and how to build curriculums or do things to help them truly understand what they were doing because it mattered. Uh, so once I decided to get into the firearm space, which was, oof, I'm dating myself, but over 20 years ago now, um, I kind of started like most people would. Uh, with just like your your big certifying bodies um, and teaching concealed carry classes or I'm an instructor now kind of stuff. And that lasted for you know roughly a decade or so. And, and then I kind of just got this nagging feeling, uh, an epiphany, I guess would be a better way to put it, that I just wasn't doing right by the people I was trying to help. Uh, I wasn't pursuing my my own education. I, I wasn't trying to be the best version of myself that I could be, uh, whether that be in my own skill level, my own teachings, uh, things like that. And I was like, well, you know, with the background I have, that's relatively extensive. Um, why not apply those same thought processes to coaching and firearms? Um, and that kind of spurred an uh, initial thought on how I would go about doing things. And I've been crafting on that ever since and, and just trying to get better at what I do on a daily basis. You know, mm -hmm. small steps, um, leave no stone unturned, figure out the best way to reach people and uh, deliver the message. And mm -hmm. that's that's really it's been a long road, but uh and we so, starting to figure it out. <laughs> well, we never have it all figured out. That's the beauty of it, right? <laughs> so what is an example then of, of you, you said that a lot of the things that you learned, then you started applying to firearms training. Could you give us an example of something that you learned there that you, that you brought into the firearm space? Yeah, I, I think just leadership in general, or like the tenets of leadership, where what happens... I shouldn't say predominantly happens, but what happens a lot in the firearms instructorship space is people are just relaying information. They're, they're not mm -hmm. really actively trying to coach or teach, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and certainly not disparaging anyone or what they're doing. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, if I go somewhere and, and I'm learning from them reading off a of PowerPoint, I, I can go to the public library and get someone to read me a story for free. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's more about I want to be in the journey with the client. 
I, I want to be with them and understand what their motivations are, uh, mm -hmm. what they're doing, why they're doing it, and actively listen to what they're trying to tell me, uh, be that via body language, language in general, uh, just understand. And I, I think that's really from understanding leadership as a whole, it doesn't really work well from a top down perspective. It, it works much better collaboratively. Um, and that was really the main thing I wanted to kind of input into how I worked uh, with teaching in general, uh, apply some of those things and, you know, understanding how adults learn, uh, understanding what makes people tick, you know, cause it can, the message is absolutely important, but how you deliver that message is what will stick. Mm -hmm. uh, then you create understanding, you know, communicating to be understood, not communicating to be heard. Mm. Well, and that requires listening too, right? I mean, maybe one of the biggest things you need to do is listen, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you talked about make what makes people tick. I'm curious because we've talked before and I know that one of the things that maybe still makes you tick, maybe it isn't as prevalent in your life now, but at one point, one thing that really made you tick was achievement and perfectionism, right? Mm -hmm. And so could you talk about that a little bit and how that's affected you both as a, as a student, but also as you work with with people um, as an instructor, uh, what have you learned personally now that you're trying to you know, better help others based on your experience with, with, achieve, with achievement? Because in the firearms space, there's a lot of people trying to achieve a lot of things, right? And a lot of probably perfectionism going on. Yeah, And, and that can be good and bad, problem. maybe. I don't know. You tell me. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, a what? Well, that's a loaded question right there, but I, I mean, from a personal perspective, <laughs> from a personal perspective, and, and I'll I'll be really transparent. I mean, I've struggled with that most of my life. Uh, the extreme hunger for achievement to to allow achievement to define who I am, uh, to define my self worth, uh, to define how I project onto the world of what my worth is. Um, and I'm slowly learning to kind of let a little bit of that go, uh, to understand that my intrinsic value or extrinsic value isn't necessarily related to what I've achieved, uh, or, or what I potentially could achieve, but the pursuit of such, uh, I believe is a measure of character. Um, so for me, for a long time. I would go after whatever it is, be it in business, be it in shooting, be it in instructorship. If I met X metric, uh, I would have this, you know, nagging feeling that that would be the thing that made me happy. And uh, normally when someone falls into that trap, the achievement becomes empty, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's nothing it's like buying a new car. You go buy a new car and it's great for about six months. And you're like, man, this is the coolest new car ever. At about month seven, it's a, it's a no, it's a payment, right? And it's, it's no mm -hmm. longer that big shiny thing that you chased after. Um, so once I started kind of realizing that and trying to let some of that go, I found it very freeing where I could actually enjoy what I was doing versus the pursuit of the end state where the actual doing and being in it and being present in it is what brought me happiness mm -hmm. and it wasn't nearly as fleeting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah. how did you get there? Cause you were extreme. Like you yeah, were right. destroying your body. You told me you were such yeah. a perfectionist and a high achiever that you were destroying your body. So what happened that made the switch for you? really the injury so I, I guess to to clarify this for some folks so in really i'm trying to put together a seminar and something i i plan on talking more about but about my kind of path and how overwork uh the wrong kind of work things like that can actually be detrimental extremely detrimental to your progress uh especially long term 
Uh, so for me, uh, the past couple years, I've been struggling with, you know, just injury after injury after injury from overwork. Um, and for people to understand that as far as it relates to shooting. So for years, I was doing uh, about three hours of dry fire a day, a thousand rounds of live fire every week, never took a day off so ever. Um, and, and it caused me some significant mm. issues physically that, that I'm still fighting to this day. Now, when that originally happened, uh, really what went down is uh, I actually punctured the nerve root of my radial and ulnar nerves in my left arm and lost the use of my left arm for about seven months. I mean, I could wow. move it kind of, but no feeling in it. Uh, and you want to talk about detrimental to your progress as a speed shooter? That that was definitely detrimental. Um, but right. once that happened, I started to realize the, the people in my tribe, uh, the people that I thought cared more about what I could achieve, actually cared about me as a person. And that was kind of freeing to me. And, and once I kind of had that realization, um, uh, it opened up a lot of doors to how I think or approach things, uh, and what it really means, uh, what it means to win, uh, what it means to, you know, be at the upper echelon of whatever it is that you're pursuing and, and what's the return on that. And it's certainly not saying you don't want to relentlessly pursue high skill that that's please, please do. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think where people make mistakes when they're wired like I am, is they don't listen to what their body's telling them. Uh, they don't listen to the sacrifices that they're making in other aspects of their life. And they're not correctly weighing the return on the investment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because anything that you pursue in life has uh you have to weigh what you're willing to give up or sacrifice in order to achieve whatever the thing is. So you have to decide how much that is worth to you yeah, and maybe, and maybe change your perspective too. It sounds like yeah, that's kind of what you did. Yeah. And it's purely individual, uh, mm -hmm. it's a purely individual thing, what your motivations are and where you want to be. Now there are absolute benchmarks in, in things that you can pursue that I believe are worth pursuing. Uh, but if you're chasing, let's frame it as like a one second draw and you're chasing a 0.7, mm -hmm. the amount of effort it takes to go from one to the next is incredibly large and certainly worthwhile pursuing if, if that's something that brings you happiness, but it, it's going to come at a cost. And is that cost worth it to you? Right. And so finally, you basically reframed your definition of success. It looks like, I mean, it sounds like that's what you did, partially because you were forced to, because the thing that you thought would bring you happiness couldn't at that particular moment be achieved because you had a physical injury. Well, I, I don't know if I, if I would say I reframed what... I would call success, but I reframed what brought me happiness for sure. Okay. And I, okay. I put significantly more stock into what brings me joy uh, over the longer term than, than right. short term short kind term. of trinkets, you mm -hmm. know, winning challenges. And man, I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm all about chasing the carrot on a stick. And, you know, I still, <laughs> I still do, uh, but I've learned that, uh, that it's it's not the be all end all of this game you know at, at mm -hmm. the end of the day who i can touch who i can reach uh the good times that happen while all of that is going on in the world those are the things that matter you know not my box full of patches and coins and stuff like that they're great but that's that's mm -hmm. really not what does it for me anymore and i Unfortunately, it took a pretty significant injury to kind of make me reframe that in my own mind. But I mean, I, yeah. I wouldn't trade it because I'm certainly happier now than I was then. That's good. 
I'd love to hear that. So when you're working with students, then, is that one of your questions to them is, you know, defining really what their goal is and, and making sure they know what it is that it's going to take in order to, to get there? Yeah, to great time expense, I open up every class, whether it's a private, whether it's a, it's a large 25 person class where we will literally sit down and we will go around and I will ask, what is your motivation? What are you looking to achieve? And what is the greatest hurdle that you are experience, experiencing in achieving that? Mm -hmm. And if it takes two minutes, great. If it takes 10 minutes, great. But that's the whole point of why mm -hmm. we're there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that gets glossed over a lot where mm -hmm. people tend to not gauge, you know, the people that are right in front of them. And because mm -hmm. people will tell you things if you just listen. Yeah. You just <laughs> you listen. Know? Yeah. And you said that you have had success with a wide variety of students, a wide variety of skill sets and backgrounds from a basic shooter all the way up to a, you know, grandmaster shooter. Why do you think that is, Chris? What's the difference there that you're able to reach out to all those different kinds of people and, and meet them where they are? Well, I think everyone, no matter what your skill level, because we, we have everyone has a, a differing level of skill and that's kind of irrelevant because the the one thing that happens to everyone no matter where they are in the journey is they will hit a block that they cannot get over mm -hmm. uh, or they can't by themselves get over uh, for some people that's very far down the path for some people that's very early on on the path and uh, i particularly pride myself on figuring out how to get them over that hurdle. Uh, and some of that may be mechanically. I mean, the, the mechanics of shooting are, are such a small piece of this grander picture uh, where I personally believe shooting, especially at a high level, is predominantly mental. It's mental based. Mm -hmm. uh, the limitations, the inability to perform uh, with exception of, of physical exceptionalities, it's going to be a mental issue, uh, be it belief, uh, you know, self image, things like that. So that's where I've gotten, you know, good traction trying to figure out by being inquisitive with somebody, what is the hurdle you're really having? Do they and always know though? They, they 99% of the time I have found if you listen intently that oh. people will often answer whatever question you have the issue is i don't really believe many people listen intently or understand why people are saying certain things um and i think if you do that and you truly care about it man the amount of information you can get is is massive um mm. and then once you have that information then you just really have to dig into how can you present the counterpoint in such a way that they understand and not only understand, but can adapt and believe what you're telling them to be true. Uh, and once that happens, man, you're off to the races. So then what would you say for yourself then was your biggest mental hurdle that you had to overcome? I know we talked about the perfectionism thing, but was there something else or was it related to that? No, I think it was related to that. So for the longest time, I mean, I was able to perform when I was physically sound. Uh, I was able to perform at a, at a relatively high level, you know, depending on on what circle we're, we're talking in. Uh, but I would always be that guy that went up to the line with like, boom, 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 heart pounding, ears hurt. Uh, because I was worried about the achievement or the end state, mm -hmm. the goal, mm -hmm. however you want to frame mm -hmm. it and not the, the mm -hmm. shooting problem at hand or the task. Mm -hmm. uh, once I kind of started to rethink about that stuff, and I think you've heard me say this, and it's something I say quite often is, especially in shooting, the task in training does not represent who you are. It is not a reflection of, of worth in any, it's a task. 
Uh, right. So now shooting means no more to me than washing dishes. I, I put no more stock into shooting a target or shooting a bill drill than I do in washing pots and pans. It's, it's a task. Mm-hmm. I know how to do the task. There's no stress involved with the task. I just do the task. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so that was really the biggest hurdle where shooting almost became a high stress activity. Training became a high stress activity because I was so worried about, you know, external judgment or Mm -hmm. my own internal judgment, things like that, which Mm -hmm. you, you will never perform at your highest level. Now, not saying physiologically there's, there's parameters are out of your control you know, but how you frame it in your mind is, is truly important to what's going on. Uh, I think you might've seen it working with students in the past when you're trying to teach a complex task, there's so much stress response related to that. They just cannot perform the function. Mm -hmm. Then it behooves us to remove the stress from that situation so they can myelinate the function. Mm-hmm. Once they understand that the function is something they can do, then then they can kind of self permit themselves to perform it. Then you can work right. on speed. Then you can work on things like that. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, it's really how I kind of work with a lot of people in relation to speed, and that's kind of what I do. I I like teaching people to go fast because you like to go fast, right? Yeah, it's my you're favorite. a speed guy, yeah, yeah, but um. What I found works really well in that regard is to take all semblance of accuracy related self judgment out of it. So Mm -hmm. not saying that accuracy doesn't matter. I want to be careful that that that's not confusing anybody. But Mm -hmm. when you are learning how to see at speed or how to uh, apply vision at speed, apply correction at speed, you first have to understand that you can see it. Uh, So Mm -hmm. once you kind of go through that, you you get a dirty target, you know, just get a dirty USPSA target with a bunch of holes in it, shoot the berm, do -hmm. whatever you feel is necessary to get your mind to acclimate to that kind of speed mm-hmm. then you start driving in parameters but first if you if you put someone on a timer and you say hey shoot the berm in one second more often than not that can happen in less than 20 minutes mm-hmm. and someone that knows how to safely you know draw right. a gun and holster a gun but they're just stuck at that one five uh one eight two two five whatever the number is if you remove some of that quantifiable metric, a piece of it, mm-hmm. and they're released just to perform the physical task, like pointing your finger at something. Yeah. It's about 0.3. And if you can point your finger at it, you can point the laser beam in your holster at it. And then, then you start introducing, well, we know we can do it. We have proven we can do it. Right. Right. And go off in their, yep. in their eyes too, because. Yep. Yeah, because they've never physically tried to go that fast before. And then when they do, they're like, wait, I can do that (laughs) physically. So I want to go back to something, too, because you said something about, you know, uh, shooting a gun is just the task I'm doing. It's just like washing dishes or whatever. I I wanted to to clarify that just a little bit in the way that I'm interpreting that. and, And let me know if, you know, if I'm off here. But what I what I how I interpret that is you're saying that. If you're not under any stress at all, like if you're on your best day at the range, let's say by yourself, there's no like pressure on you, undue pressure anyway, and you're performing this task well, you've already proven to yourself that you know how to do this task. It's not the task when you're under pressure that's the problem because you've proven over and over and over and over again that you know how to do the task. So the only other thing it could be is the mental hang up and I have to pull the book out because everything you're saying ties back to this book with winning in mind. If you guys haven't read this book, you should Lanny Basham with winning in mind. And that's where you start deep diving into the mental management process that he talks about in this book. 
And I think, isn't that kind of where you were going with that in trying to separate the task from the mental management? And it's really the mental management where people get hung up. It's not the task itself usually. Once you've got it down, you've, you know, then, then you have to start working on the mental aspect of it. So such good stuff. I love this yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's, so with anything, I, I think, and I've, I've tried over the years, just a myriad of ways to kind of frame it in my mind, but mm -hmm. uh, a, a good way I found it. And again, I'm not advocating this. This is just an analogy. <laughs> but like someone learning how to drive, how mm -hmm. mentally taxing that is. Mm -hmm. And then later on in life, when when that is a task that is so burned in or ingrained in your ability to do it, someone can go from point A to point B and not even really understand how they got to point B. They just got there. They're, mm -hmm. they're thinking about paying their taxes. Who knows? Uh, not advocating, you know not paying attention while you're driving, but it, it happens. And it, it's much like any other endeavor. Once you learn the, the mechanical aspect of it, what's left? And, and you're absolutely right. You're spot on on how you kind of rephrased it. But if you have done this, whatever it is, 100 times, 1,000 times, 8,000 times, and the only time you struggle with it barring the outliers of, of anything that happens, mm -hmm. but the law of averages says, you know, not everything will be perfect every time. But if the only time you truly struggle is when you feel that there's either some external force or some internal force that you cannot control, mm -hmm. where do we apply the correction? Right. And, and really what happens a lot of times, especially in firearms, the, the, the correction applied is grip gun harder, Mm -hmm. Pull trigger the better. Physical. Yeah. It's, that's not, in my opinion, where the majority of the answers lie. Now, uh, you know, sound coaching practice says certainly any adversity related to the mechanical needs to be addressed, mm -hmm. but not in replacement of the other side of the spectrum, where that's really where I believe high, high, high end you know, performance lies. Right. Well, and I saw a video of you recently and I try not to watch a bunch of videos of somebody before I have them on, which may seem counterproductive, but I didn't want to watch interviews of other people interviewing you because I didn't want to, I don't know. I just wanted to ask my own questions in my own way and, and not have any, you know, I don't want to hear the stories already and then you tell them to me again and it not be like a authentic experience of hearing it for the first time. But I did watch the video you did with Brian Hill, uh, one of them, and you guys talked about why you were good training partners with each other. And I want you guys to hear this because I think this could be helpful for you because many of you probably train with other friends or family or whatever. And you guys talked about how you know, you've already said you're a speed guy. We know Brian is an accuracy guy. And you talked about how um, there's more than one way to get to the same place. Whereas he came from the accuracy side and he, he said it so well, of course, I can't remember exactly what he said, but you came from the speed side where you were, you were kind of wired up and he kind of needed to, you were from like what we call a high arousal level really up here. And he was down here and needed to kind of bump up. And so that's why you guys were good for each other as training partners. Um, is there anything to be learned from that? Or do you have any advice in that regard? Yeah, I, I think understanding how you're wired is important. Uh, yeah. Understanding where your proclivities lie is, is certainly important. Uh, but, you know, I have a strong affinity for Brian Hill. You know, this <laughs> so do I. Yeah, uh, we both are very tenacious in nature. Uh, we just go about things in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. So I how do how do I want to frame this? So <laughs> I, I think if we put it as like boxers, like Brian is like a consummate heavyweight that is fast in in such a way that the efficiency creates the speed yeah uh, i'm more like what you would see in like a what they would call an unorthodox middleweight uh which i have a very uh 
herky jerky kind of almost electric kind of style uh that just works with my body type it's it's really how i'm wired so you can achieve the same things um with a different pathway to get there uh where brian don't don't let him fool you because he he talks all that not being a speed guy but uh, homeboy (laughs) well i saw his car so i know he likes to go fast well he's been dropping point sevens in demos for a while now. holy cow yeah i'm not saying he's not fast i know the dude's fast he doesn't look fast though that's what's crazy about him yeah that's he's so efficient right and it's almost it's i find like pistol craft to be truly an art form you know it's once you learn the mechanics of how to use your paintbrush and, and i hope i'm not getting weird but no it's really an art so you can have yeah. master painters that have extremely different approaches yeah but the art itself can be beautiful in its own right and and yeah. still just as as masterful yeah yeah, that's really fun to watch too. I love watching shooters of all different styles and backgrounds and types because you can learn something from everybody. You really can take something away from um, everybody. Um, so, guys, hey, by the way, we're running out of time already. <laughs> I feel like we just got started, no. and uh, and so we're not running out of time. But um, but I do want to remind you if you have questions for Chris, please drop those in the comments because we're going to be getting to the Q and A shortly. So um, I'm sure you guys have questions for him. He's a uh, I have enjoyed this so much, but I, I want to get into something here real quick before we get into the Q and A, and that is um, a lot of the things we've been talking about. Chris, uh, relate to the uh, active self-protection instructor program that I'm in and that you help co-direct with Carrie Dudenhofer. And um, and so I just wanted you to speak on that a little bit. I'm not even quite sure how you got involved with that. Um, if you could speak to that and then and what your role is there. And, you know, what have you learned from being involved with that? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Too many questions. <laughs> so the active self-protection instructor certification program is it, it, it's something that I hold very, very dear. And, and I don't say that lightly. Um, and really what it is, and well, let me explain what it's not. Uh, so there's a myriad of, of instructor programs out there where you can go, you know, listen to someone dictate information shoot your qual and get your certification. That is not what this is. Um, the, the certification that we're doing uh, through kind of the idea of, of John Korea, Stephanie Widener was to create something that, that had more value. Um, and really it, it puts in, you know, aspects that don't normally get talked about, you know, having a, a high professional ethical and moral code into what we're doing and what it really means because it's important. There's really no regulatory body uh, in firearms instruction, uh, nor do I necessarily believe that there needs to be one, uh, but there's really very few places you can go to, to one, you know, teach adults, understand what it's like to run a business in this space, um, you know, provide more value than you take off the table to the people we serve. Mm-hmm. And, and I use that word serve carefully. Um, so, you know, understanding curriculum design, uh, understanding self introspection and, and really trying to improve your craft. Uh, that's something that are like core tenants of, of what we're doing. It's a long program. Uh, it's a six month time investment. Um, it's, it's got a relatively hefty monetary investment, but I believe what people get in return, uh, far exceeds that. Uh, so between myself and Carrie and, and Carrie's my spirit animal. So normally I'm the, deep <laughs> uh, but in, in our relationship, Carrie is really the queen of detail and, uh, I'm allowed to kind of be flighty and, and do what I do and think in concepts and things like that. And she handles really all the detail work so when you pair us together we have a a a really solid ability to 
get a lot of stuff done. Uh, and you couple that with the senior leadership team of ASP really putting forth huge amounts of time into each cohort. Uh, I, I think it's one of the better investments you can make in yourself. Um, we are not a certification mill. Uh, we are highly selective on, on who we train. Uh, and and it's, it's hard. It's not easy. But uh, the return thereafter is is pretty big. Um, and, and really what we're trying to do person by person, one person at a time, is, is kind of change the face of instructorship or at least have people understand that there's a better way. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm a big, big fan. Uh, how I got involved in it. So I was actually a graduate of cohort two, the second cohort. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really made some lifelong friendships in that. So people that are still in my professional circle, my personal circle, um, that I would rely on to this day to provide me with solid, meaningful advice. Uh, so there's that communal aspect that mm -hmm. I think is, is great. Um, and really from that point on, it was, it was really kind of a life changing, not, not a professional changing endeavor it was a life-changing endeavor for me uh, i had some some really big epiphanies about who i was what i had to offer and, and how i wanted to broadcast that to the world in my experience uh, mm -hmm. so past that i volunteered uh, for the longest time just wanted to be involved wanted to help people along the way and mm -hmm. uh over time that's developed and and i was afforded the opportunity which i'm supremely grateful for um, to do more and and I would do it again in a heartbeat and I will continue to do it until they run me off. <laughs> well, we're so glad that you are doing it. You are, uh, you and Carrie are I mean, one of a kind people and just the biggest hearts in the world to help people. Um, and so, Oh, we were going to get into the Q and a here. Um, but usually before we get into the Q and a, we do, um, you know, hey, where can people find you? They can do their little plug. Well, we talked about this. Chris, Chris has got enough work to do. <laughs> so that's why we don't have any banners for him going across. So we're advertising active self-protection, of course, and the instructor certification. But um, but there's a reason for that, right, Chris? Yeah, and, I, and I'm not afraid to speak on that either. So uh, really, uh, I have a tendency to overextend myself. Um, so <laughs> no way. I, I purposely kind of try and keep things quiet. Uh, I predominantly do private instruction under the tactical advantage banner. Uh, my website is currently being redone, uh, to more reflect that. Uh, so if people are actually trying to find me, um, the one way would be through the active self-protection instructor certification program. Another way would be via the complete combatant. Uh, I take ever every opportunity I can to help Brian and Shelly and the rest of the team there. Um, but really, if you're hunting for me in general right now, probably the best way to find me is just find me on Facebook. I'm Christopher Bean. I'm, I'm not hiding. <laughs> uh, I am active in the uh, active cell protection dry fire group on Facebook. Uh, so I, I go and try and when I can uh, just help out whoever is looking for help. Uh, I was for a while pretty prolific on Facebook in gun groups, but I, I started kind of pulling away from that because it, it just, there wasn't a whole bunch of value. Um, and it, it, there's just a lot of gun groups on Facebook are just ugly places. And, and I've mm -hmm. kind of tried to limit ugliness in my life, but, uh, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's really, I have found from a business perspective that one's reputation can go so much further than, you know, being prolific, uh, with exposure. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I really don't seek it because that's not what motivates me. Uh, the people that I've been fortunate enough to help or work with have a tendency to just find me. And, and that's kind of the way I like it, you know, not mm -hmm. saying that's the way it will be forever. Mm -hmm. Uh, but 
really the last year, especially my focus has been on active cell protection and, uh, trying to do whatever I could to help at the complete combatant. And, uh, I don't see that really changing for the foreseeable future. Uh, but eventually it will, eventually I will not have three jobs <laughs> and, uh, I will <laughs> probably a little bit more exposure, but really I, I have to be very cautious about what I do with my time because I'm a husband, I'm a father. Sure. Um, yeah. and those things yeah. matter a lot to me and I already have a huge time expense, uh, just meeting the obligations that I have now. Now, certainly not saying that that doesn't mean that I don't want to talk to people or take on new clients or anything like that. Um, I'm just not looking to get flooded with it. Mm hmm. Well, you're one person, so <laughs> I don't think you can be duplicated, Chris. <laughs> At all. <laughs> well, no, I don't think so. Well, we've got a lot of questions, so let's get to our questions. There's some really good ones in here I'm looking forward to. And by the way, after the Q&A, stick around because I'm going to tell you who's going to be on next week, and I'm going to do an audience poll. I need your help with something. So. I'm going to do these in order. So Laura wants to know if you're going to be at the conference this Absolutely. year. Absolutely. That, okay. that is one of my favorite, favorite things of the year. Okay, good. All right. And Scars wants to know, he says, you've talked about the value of filming yourself. Could you quickly go over the best camera angles to work for working draw to first shot? So I am a huge advocate for filming yourself. Um, there's, there's a big disconnect with people. Like they're like, Oh, I don't want to hear my voice on tape. Oh, I don't want to see myself on tape. And, and that's really an easy push off to say, I do not want to analyze what I'm doing. I, I want to continue doing what I'm doing because I feel comfortable with it. Um, so I, I think stretching yourself to do that is, is hugely important. Uh, I'm also an advocate that most people can relatively easily diagnose a lot of issues that they run into by doing that. Uh, if you see wild movements going on, you, mm -hmm. there might be an efficiency thing you need to address, right? Uh, and it would stand out quickly. Uh, so from an angle perspective, to answer the question directly, I, I think it really depends on what you're trying to approach. Uh, but I'm an advocate to go multiple angles. So uh, sometimes I'll film myself directly from the front so I can see what my eyes are doing and see if I have any slight head tilt, things like that, on a, for, especially for a draw to first shot. Uh, side angles to see when is my support hand coming to the gun, is my support hand coming late? And then so there's things that your dot or your sights will normally tell you what's happening. But when you have another perspective of it, what you may not be 100% telling yourself the truth about will jump out at you. Mm -hmm. uh, I also do the back from time to time, uh, but I've gotten really creative with mine over the years. Like if, if I believe I have shoulder things going on and I, I can't really diagnose how to make it stop, uh, like a little trick that I've done is I'll, I'll dry fire against a wall, like my back against the wall. Mm -hmm. So I have like a tactile, impression of what's moving like i can oh yep that wasn't right um so really don't be afraid to be creative there is no right or wrong answer you know <laughs> just go for it try and figure out everything you can because no one will be a better advocate for your shooting than you no one uh, i don't care how motivated they are so <laughs> that's an investment that man, just experiment, see what you can yeah. see. And that's fun too. Stephanie wants to know what resource has had the most impact on you, book, class, thought, person, whatever. Hmm. That's a good question, Steph. So let me see. <laughs> so from a person perspective, uh, I think who really opened the gate for me to be who I was. Uh, especially in the firearms related space was, was Gabe White. And I've, I've told this story a bunch of times over, but Gabe. I've uh, never heard it. Well, if anyone's unfamiliar, Gabe is a, a very unique individual. And unequivocally, he is who he is. He doesn't pretend to be anyone else. Uh, 
and watching him work and seeing someone that, and I, I believe I identify with him. I think we're wired similarly in a lot of different ways mm -hmm. and watching him teach and, and watching the, the skill development that he's had uh, over the course of a couple of years was just truly inspiring to me. Uh, so he's really the one that made me say, okay, I can be who I am. I, I don't have to be someone else and kind of embrace that. And uh, once I started doing that, things just got a lot easier. Now, there's a ton of books. I'm a, I'm a voracious reader. Um, I, I cannot remember the name of the author right now, but a relatively short read that I thought was great was The Speed of Trust um anything from dweck is good um carnegie stuff i mean there's just tons and tons and tons uh it's hard to place because i i just throw everything in the big bucket in my head and just keep mm -hmm. loading stuff in the bucket mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh what i will say you know what let me let me i think the person i owe the biggest debt of gratitude in relation to shooting so and I'll name him by name. So I have a friend in the Pacific Northwest that I had take a, taken a hiatus from shooting for multiple years, uh, a hiatus from instructing for multiple years. And uh, my friend Tim Porter had just gotten into shooting and, and he really wanted someone to go shooting with him. And uh, we started going and, and he caught the bug really quick. And he actually re-engaged me in this whole world again you know someone coming in new that saw it with new eyes and wanted to get better and you know was driven to get better he brought me back into this fold and and i owe him big for that i'll owe him for the rest of my life for that mm. and uh so he went from basically oh gosh i don't know when it was 2015 or something uh to actually going into instructorship himself uh, I think he's currently working uh, at the PSTC under Gabe White, you know, over the course of a year. So another guy that was just driven to do really good work that, you know, I owe a lot to. And that's awesome. That's serious. Yeah, you never know who, you, who you're going to touch or inspire. For sure. All right. We're halfway through the questions. Okay. Uh, Clint, I was informed that I forgot to... Uh, shout out to you in the beginning. So I apologize. And, and thank you for coming watching. We appreciate you, Clint. <laughs> so Clint wants to know what is Chris's favorite drill and why? The bill drill. The bill drill. Of course. Of course, the bill drill. Uh, <laughs> just because I like to see what's achievable with that. You know, it's, it, it covers a lot yeah. of things. Uh, but really, how fast can I reliably run that gun? And can I get hits where I want? And if I can't, what do I have to change to get there? So that's a, a really fun drill to like just chase and play with. And, you know, there's people out there like Isaac Lockwood that are running bill drills in I, times that I just did not believe were achievable. And when someone kind of pierces that veil of what is humanly achievable, that's what inspires me to work more. That's what inspires me because it's fun. What can I do with the tools that I have? What is possible? So yeah, the bill drill. I love it. And you hit on something there too that I forget sometimes and I, and it has to be fun guys. It, I mean, if you're going to be inspired to do something great in any aspect of your life, I mean, yes, you have to work hard and some of it's going to suck, but a lot of it has to be because you love to do it right. Or else like, why are you doing it? I think that's my opinion. Okay, John wants to know, um, who is Chris's favorite character from The Other Guys, and why is it Terry Hoyts? I don't know. It's Terry Hoyts, but I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Just because. Just because. Okay, and the next question is, uh, will you give the talk about it's okay to fail? I often don't get as much out of a class because it really hurts my feelings to miss. So I think it's more than okay to fail. It's, it's an absolute requirement for growth. Like yeah. you have to, if you never failed, you are never going to push back the, 
the boundary of, of where you are. It, it's, it's an absolute necessity in any endeavor, any learning endeavor that you're doing and anyone that believes otherwise is, is really in for a hard road, uh, especially if they want to push into the world of, you know, high level proficiency where, I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. This is why I believe the proliferation of like Instagram and a lot of stuff like that. And Facebook, I, I said earlier, was like ugly because what I believe that's created in a lot of circles is this false belief that anyone can do these things at any time, no matter what. And certainly there are people that, that have put in the work that can, but they don't show you the failures, the mm -hmm. hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of failures to get there. Uh, so when I first started my Instagram page, which it's really small and just little stuff, but man, I threw up a bill drill that had five Charlies on it just so everyone would know. Yep. I can throw five Charlies on a bill drill <laughs> <laughs> and so can everyone else. Yeah. That's good. That's important to remember. I think that we talk of, we've talked about that too, about struggle, like embrace struggle instead of trying to avoid it. Right. Same with failure, I think. Yeah. And it's, it's the same thing with, with everything, learning to walk, you know, it's ingrained in the human condition that failure creates ability. You know, if you look at a toddler learning how to walk, the first three weeks of it are, are strife with, with stumbles and misplacements and learning to hold things. But what does it do? Every lesson that is learned in that path is adapted mm -hmm. into the task execution until the execution is, is mindless. It, it's ingrained in what you do. So you have to, that's what creates, you know, comms in your brain to say okay that did not work and this is why do this instead if you never push past any of those you'll never get to the experimentation phase of learning which is right. where learning occurs that's where all the fun stuff happens yeah okay alex wants to know how can someone get additional training with you facebook <laughs> Find him on Facebook. Certification. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I can throw my website out there. It is under construction, but it'll be tactical adv.com. Dot com. And it's it's just literally if you go there, it's just under construction right now. I pulled it down and I'm completely redoing it. And because I so suck <laughs> at doing <laughs> stuff like that when it, it's like my stuff, uh, it's been in that state for like three or four months. So I'm embarrassed to say that's, that. But it's true. That's totally normal, actually. Okay. Uh, Catherine wants to know, will Chris be at the Mingle? Yes, I absolutely will. Okay. And the last question of the night is from Bill. And he says, at what point does the dog make an appearance? I'm feeling um, a little shortchanged. Is, uh, he in, is he in the room? No, Caesar goes night-night at, at 730. He has oh. to go night-night at 730 because he is a bad dog when he's overtired. And he's... <laughs> And it is past your bedtime, too. So uh, I really appreciate your time here tonight. I think that's all the questions we have, unless Adam missed something. But I'll blame him later if that's the case. <laughs> so, Chris, is there anything that you want to leave people with before uh, before we get on to our who, who our guests will be next week? Yeah, I mean, for anyone watching that's like struggling with something, especially in relation to your shooting, just just embrace it and, and understand that trying to eliminate that from the equation isn't necessarily going to solve the problem. Uh, if, if your hurdles are self-imposed, just begin to understand that. And then the, it's limitless. It's limitless what you can do. Uh, that's the great thing about shooting is it's not a hugely physical endeavor. And I, I think that's where people get a little bit confused <clears throat> is they put so much effort into the physicality of it. They end up hurting themselves, burning out, 
uh, not wanting to continue and press forward, just understand it. Take the time to put the puzzle together and, and just go, man. Be tenacious. Tenacity is a superpower. <laughs> uh, yeah, and f- I think find your tribe, find your support system too. I think Natalie talked about that last week when when she was on. And um, I think helping find people that truly care about you and, and what it is that you want to achieve is helpful, even if they don't know all the answers, like sometimes just bouncing something off of somebody is really helpful. Absolutely true. Yeah. Well, Chris, I'm going to, I'm going to cut you loose here for now. I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know it's late where you're at. And um, I think we, I got a lot out of this interview. I really appreciate your time. I think others did too. So thank you again. Awesome. I appreciate it very much, Laura. You're doing a great job. You and Adam are doing a great job. And I I don't want to miss the opportunity to tell you that you are doing good work. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. So let's move on uh, to who is going to be on next week. Um, So I'm looking forward to this interview as well. I mean, there's I look forward to all of them, (laughs) but next week is going to be Ross Hick with Citizens Defense Research, and I'm going to give his background here in just a second, and you'll understand why I need your help. So um, we have so many things that we can go over next week with Ross, and I don't think that an hour is going to be enough time to do it. So I want your opinion. If you'll shout out in the comments, if any of this stuff really resonates with you and you would like to hear about it specifically, Um, please let me know. And then I'm going to give his credentials too after these topics so that you understand how he is such an expert in these things that uh, this is just going to be a great live next week. So the possible topics for next week with Ross Hick, criminal mindset of different criminal actors and what works and what doesn't to avoid, detect, and deter them. Uh, Sex offenders and sex trafficking, dispelling myths and what to look for. And the third one is the psychology of critical incidents, trauma jobs, and how to best survive them. So Ross Hick is with Citizens Defense Research. He's a former EMT and a current probation surveillance officer supervising convicted felons in the community with 14 years working specialized caseloads, including gangs, domestic violence, sex offenders, and the seriously mental, mentally ill. He serves as a field training officer, a department armorer, and an instructor in CPR, AED, firearms, taser, search and seizure, and use of force for his department, and has additionally taught firearms classes to lawfully armed citizens in his community for more than 16 years. So he has a lot of uh, experience and uh, a lot of things that we could talk about, a lot of places we could go with him. So of those three topics that I just shouted out, if anything in particular um, is something you would like him to talk about, we might be able to talk about all of it in one hour, but I doubt we could go very deep with any of it. But um, I'm just interested to know what it is you guys want to hear. And with the experience that he has, um, he can provide us with a lot of good information. So I hope you'll tune in for that one. That'll be next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Mountain Time. I hope you'll be able to tune in with us. Um, Really enjoyed uh, our interview tonight, and I hope I'll see you again next week.